There we go. Uh, and I, I do want to thank the, the Bow Foundation for um, uh, providing this, the seed money to uh, get this uh, study started. Um, so I'm just going to go through with you and, and tell you exactly what I put in the proposal uh, to, the, to the Bow Foundation um, and um, kind of how we envision uh, this, uh, this study evolving and uh, really uh, would appreciate uh, all of your uh, feedback into how we can make things better um, and uh, as this is kind of going to be an ever evolving uh, uh, study. So um, I'm going to start out with our specific aims. Um, there are kind of four main goals um, that I kind of proposed. Uh, the first was to try and get some sort of ha better handle um, on the, the clinical phenotype of um, the, what we're kind of calling GNAO associated neurologic disease for lack of a better term. Um, and we were, pl we're planning on doing this um, by uh, setting up a retrospective study um, uh, to kind of uh, get, get the records as a, of as many patients as we uh, possibly can and uh, see uh, if we can make some association between the genes and the, and the, the phenotype. And so um, uh, the, the way that we have, and by the way, anybody who's was part of this clinic to, uh, this week is kind of by default enrolled in this kind of retrospective study. Um, the, the reason why I proposed um, a retrospective study in addition to kind of this prospective um, natural history clinic is to really, um, I didn't want to, you know, ignore any patients that couldn't travel for either reasons of finances or disability level uh, because it could really skew our understanding of the disease. Um, and I really wanted to just gather as many, um, as many, uh, as much patient information as, as we could so we can get as broad of an understanding as possible. And so um, I'm planning on using uh, the registry as kind of our jumping off point um, uh, such that we use the, the data that, that's kind of already there. And then we'll probably reach out to those families that um, have already entered information into uh, the registry um, to see if they're uh, interested or willing to uh, participate further in this. And what it'll entail is we're going to attain um, the medical records, primarily the same things that you guys brought, uh, copies of the MRI images, copies of the EEG tracings, um, you know, um, a neurologist report and probably reports from the physical, occupational, and speech therapist um, so that we can kind of get a sense of um, the history of how things have evolved with the patient um, and, um, and where they currently stand. And then I'm hoping to, and we're still working out the logistics of, of how exactly we're going to do this, but we'd like to do a one-time remote assessment, um, hopefully via some sort of video conferencing with the, with the family and the, and the child or adult, um, and such that I can um, kind of remotely ask them uh, you know, questions uh, in a similar way to the way I asked all of you questions, um, and uh, do some sort of um, remote assessment as much as possible of, of their abnormal movements. Um, and then I'm gonna, we're gonna send some red cap forms to have uh, the, the families fill out the same CP child um, kind of quality of life survey. And I would love to hear from you guys if you thought that this was a good quality of life survey. Um, you know, did it, did it kind of capture um, some of the um, so some of the things that you struggle with and, and uh, so that we can um, get a sense of the uh, caregiver burden and the burden on the, on the, on the patient as well. We're going to send out um, a form with, you know, just a whole lot of symptoms to say, does your child have this? So that we can further identify, you know, anything that we, is kind of not on our ra radar screen um, and so that we're not missing anything that could, is potentially affecting people. And, and a symptom log that I'll explain a little bit more. And then hopefully publish uh, publish that data um, sooner than we could publish for a prospective study to get more information out to the community. Um, and I'm really hoping to kind of collaborate with with other um, investigators, including at Stanford. Um, the the assessments that we're going to be doing are slightly different, so it could be um, somewhat of a um, um, uh, some symbiotic, not symbiotic, that's not the right word, but um, <laughs> synergistic. synergistic, that's what I was looking for, um, uh, endeavor. 
um, and kind of a re continual reassessment of, okay, are we, are we uh, getting at the heart of GNA01? Are we, are we sampling the right things? Um, and this is kind of a, a little bit of a, a laundry list of, of, of what we're hoping to get at. Um, basically, you know, understanding, you know, duration, frequency, and characteristics of seizures and movement disorders, you know, um, and, and I think I kind of went over all of this already. So um, the second uh, specific aim is what we were, have all been participating in uh, the last couple days, and that's the, pr the prospective study. And um, I, I think Dr. Hershey is going to talk about a little bit about this in the next um, in, in the next talk uh, of, of Wolfram syndrome and, and how uh, this this clinic was largely based uh, on the model that the Wolfram Clinic uh, established and how it's really important to establish prospective uh, data. So finding things that you can measure and figuring out okay what is changing over time. Okay, what is it that um, if we're going to intervene with something, we want to know how, how different variables change over time in the natural history such that when we do go, go to do clinical trials, we can, we can not have as big of a placebo group and we can also know, okay, well, this is not going to be a good measurement because, you know, either this doesn't change over time or this changes, you know, too slowly or, you know, that there's various things that we can, we can talk about. Um, and so really, um, this, this, is, um, this is aimed at gathering data to show that we can you know, objectively measure things in this disorder such that we have um, you know, outcome measures for future clinical trials. And really my goal with this proposal to the Bow Foundation was to, to say, yes, we can get families together. We can, we can um, provide objective measures in these children um, such that we can apply for much bigger funding um, in, in a year or two. Um, and so um, what I proposed was uh, kind of three in-person clinics over two years uh, with a kind of uh, virtual check-in at six months. So you guys might be hearing from us. Um, in about six months' time, and so I can kind of get an update on how are things going and what's changed, and and um, and so that we can and and that we were going to meet as a team um, to go over what, what did we measure, what, what did we think was effective, what was not effective, um, so that by the time we can get bigger funding, um, that we're ready to go, um, and we have we uh, we we have we have knowledge of what can be measured and what can't. So um, we designed this clinic um, um, as kind of, uh, you know, uh, in, to be run in some different stations. And so for those of you that weren't there, uh, what we do is we, um, we have the kids and the families come to our um, pediatric uh, research clinic. And um, it starts, the day starts out with um, doing um, informed consent. Um, and we gather info from the families. Uh, we get, get all the medical records. Uh, we give them a few uh, questionnaires, including the, the quality of life questionnaire um, and the symptom log. Um, and then they rotate. Um, uh, the, they, each of them came to see me for an hour where um, I looked at their movement disorders. I did um, some rating scales to, to try and quantify the different movements. Um, they saw Dr. Goodkin if they had epilepsy, um, so we could get more information about that. They saw the physical therapist who did um, uh, the GMFM, the gross uh, motor function uh, measure, and the modified Ashworth to look at gross motor function. They saw our occupational therapist to do the Peabody de developmental scale to really get at um, more fine motor and um, activities of daily living. Um, and um, so these are some of the um, kind of outcome measures that we're going to be looking at to see. Um, and in the end, what we'll probably do is not do all, all of the parts of all of these, okay? We're gonna see what we think is appropriate for this pa patient population, because all of these scores were developed for other diseases, right? Um, and so that's what part of the team is gonna be meeting with, you know, um, later in the year to, to kind of discuss. Um, and then I wanna talk a little bit about the symptom log that you should, guys should have all received. If you guys didn't get it, please let me know. Um, and uh, when I'm gonna, what I want to do is every six months just get, kind of get a, a snapshot in time of, okay, how many seizures are they having? How many movements episodes are they having? How bad are the movements? Um, so we can see, because otherwise we're just having one snapshot in time right now, one day. Um, that's not necessarily representative of 
you know, what real life is, um, especially if it's in the clinic. And also to get at, you know, is there any irritability? How is sleeping? You know, because it can be hard for you to kind of remember back, and I say, how's sleep? And you kind of think, oh, well, right now, sleep is fine. You know, six months from now, you might be, oh, sleep is horrible, you know? And we want to kind of capture it at multiple time points. So my early thoughts um, from the clinic, um, the first one was, I can't believe that we made the front page of the newspaper. <laughs> and I think it's, I, I think it's a real testament to um, the advocacy of the Bo Foundation and all the parents um, that have really reached out to the media. Um, this was all they're doing, it was not my doing. Um, and to, to really uh, help raise awareness and also um, to really, <laughs> um, uh, it, it really helps the, the hospital work to help us. Uh, so, um, and the other thing is that, um, so I showed my daughter uh, the pictures that were on the, the website uh, for the article, and her comment was to me, Mom, we have to do something about that gray hair. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you know, I've been a little more busy, you know, I just didn't have time to dye my hair. She's like, I'll remind you. <laughs> so, um, and those of you that met her last night are probably not surprised, you know, walking around with a tag that says Ellie the Valiant. <laughs> um, so my, my other take homes is that, like, the, the families and kids are amazing, like, and one of the fa parents said uh, something to the effect of, there's, there's got to be something in this gene mutation that causes their smiles to be uh, infectious. And I, 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 I totally agree. Like, I couldn't stop, even though I was exhausted, like, I couldn't stop smiling the entire time. And, um, and I think it's really interesting because I, I do think that the lack of significant mood symptoms is, um, seems to be somewhat unique, um, especially in other diseases that I've studied. I do think that there's some anxiety that we're gonna need to tease out how much, is there, is it just from, um, you know, not having control over uh, your ability to interact with the world, or is it something that's inherent to the pathophysiology of the disease? I think that, I think it's gonna, it's gonna be something that's difficult to, to tease out, but the, you know, it's, certainly the mouse work helps with that too. But I think the, 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 the remarkable resiliency of these kids and, and how motivated they are to, to work hard and um, is, is impressive and that comes from somebody who takes care of a lot of rare diseases. Um, I all had hypotonia at birth, um, almost all had uh, early developmental delay. That was kind of the only thing that was kind of consistent across the board. Um, there was a tremendous variability in the movement disorders. Um, I mean, I knew that going in, but um, it kind of hit home a little, even a little bit more to me. Um, it's not just the Korean. Um, the most common um, uh, combination that I saw was kind of a mixed dystonia in Korea with essential hypotonium. Um, uh, the other uh, uh, patterns that I saw were uh, a mixed dystonia in Korea with spasticity. Um, I saw some kids with Korea only. Um, and then I saw some with hypotonia and what we call um, uh, hypokinesia, or just kind of lack of movement, um, or just very poor quality movement. Um, and um, there were some new symptoms that um, I kind of uh, have, are on my radar for the first time, and I literally went home Thursday night and altered my, um, the, the, the forms that I was uh, taking notes on to include these. Um, so temper temperature regulation seems to be a common theme um, in difficulty being too hot or too cold. Um, and it, it makes me really wonder if there's any correlation between this and the kind of autonomic storms that, I'm, that I've seen in the ICU. Um, uh, I think it's a little bit too early to tell, but it's an interesting uh, thought and interesting pathophysiology uh, thing to, to think about. Um, uh, because it's, I don't think it's, it's uh, I think it's an underrecognized phenomenon, but that I've definitely been convinced is something that is not just related to the movement. Um, and then this odd um, thing, an uh, aversion to bright sunlight, which I have no idea why that would be, but I, um, after I heard it from one family, um, I started asking other families and they're like, oh yeah, we have to put sunglasses on and they, they, they they, they, they can't open their eyes. If we take pictures in, in bright sunlight, their eyes are always closed. And so I have no idea why this would be, but I think it's interesting and we'll keep it on the list. Um, certainly if you guys 
like think of other symptoms that we didn't talk about or kind of, you know, you go home and it's like, oh, I should have told her that. You know, certainly let us know so that we can, you know, put it, kind of put it on the list um, to see. Um, and then kind of our third specific aim is to try and develop a rating scale um, and, and other biomarkers um, kind of as, as um, some of the other researchers have alluded to. Um, I've had experience in doing, uh, helping with this with uh, the Wolfram uh, Clinic, and um, I think having one that's very specific to GNA1 that that looks at the uh, you know very specific problems that uh, they deal with um, can be helpful. Although rating scales are um, inherently um, subjective, and so are, but at least it would be um, more specific. Um, and then our last would be to kind of generate you know, an initial set of best practice recommendations so that we can start helping um, all of your local providers uh, more um, and develop some sort of level of expertise um, so that pe people and uh, families and providers don't feel alone um, in dealing with this. Um, so kind of moving forward, kind of thinking more kind of long term, um, and this is not, um, you know, this is kind of more movement disorder focused and because uh, that's what I am, but um, you know, thinking further about biomarker development and seeing if we can come up with anything that is more objective. You know, I think that the most tantalizing target for me uh, would be um, MRI data because I think there's more and more evidence that, especially in the kids who have regression, who end up in the ICU with um, these horrible movements, that there are changes on MRI over time, that almost everybody's MRI is normal at first, um, but that um, at some point, um, there does seem to be some changes. And what, what's the chicken or the egg? Um, is, is, um, are the changes in the brain um, leading to the intense movements? And then, um, or are the intense movement storms leading to some sort of uh, changes in the brain? And, and I think that impacts our, um, our thinking on when do you do deep brain stimulation? Um, the problem with that is that MRIs are expensive, and almost all of our kids need to be sedated. So, I mean, trying to think of creative strategies about, you know, maybe putting the kids in the, in the scanner in the middle of the night, you know, when they're asleep or something, I don't know. It, it, it's, it's gonna, it would be challenging, to say the least, but I don't want to take it off the table because I think there's real promise there to, to potentially have a, something quantitative that we could, could measure and um, measure uh, tra trajectory over time. Should we be including EEGs? Um, you know, I think we're going to take a step back and look at some of the EEG tracings in the kids who have epilepsy, see if there's um, some common features that we can find. Uh, whether or not we include EEGs on the kids who don't have epilepsy, I think is an open question. And, you know, we would have to have very specific questions of, okay, we're looking for this, you know. Um, I don't think we should just go do EEGs on everybody just to do it. Um, and then gait analysis, this has been brought up before. It's something that I've always had an interest in, and um, me and Dr. Newbig have talked about this before, is um, obviously in the kids who are, um, who are ambulatory, um, it's, it's an obvious way to get quantitative data uh, about their gait, but even in the kids who are, who are non-ambulatory, if there's a way that we can use um, the same type of analysis to kind of quantitate the, the total amount of movement or the total amount of extra unwanted movement, um, I, you know, could be helpful um, in, in future um, to, to validate uh, drug e efficacy or, you know, intervention efficacy. Um, and then I think I've talked to many of you about, you know, the potential of potentially doing a, a DBS clinical trial um, and um, to, you know, better determine, um, get solid evidence of, of efficacy. I think we all agree that it, it reduces the extra one in movements, but you know, uh, establishing the, the, the evidence as such to in, improve our ability to get it paid for by insurance. Um, and, uh, and then also to determine like optimal settings and location. Um, I found out this week that there's at least one uh, patient who um, has their simulator in the subthalamic nucleus and not in the GPI and is doing really well. Um, should we be thinking about that target instead of the globus pallidus? And should we be doing the surgery before the bad Korea storms happen? Um, and I think this is the big open question. Um, right, up to now, I haven't been able to find anybody in the literature that has gotten the surgery before they've you know, had very severe movements. The, the one case being 
one of the patients that I did in San Francisco that I haven't published yet. Um, but should we, should we be doing this more earlier, you know, uh, before things get bad? Um, and, you know, how would we would design a study to, to, to determine who should get it and when? Um, I think these are all big questions that I'm posing um, that I don't have answers to yet, um, but to um, kind of prompt discussion and kind of give you an idea of, you know, yes, you guys are participating in this, and, but this is building the groundwork for what, you know, what can come in the future, and this is so very important what we're doing. So um, I'm going to leave it there. Um, I've got one question. Mm -hmm. So we had 20 people participate in the clinic mm -hmm. Thursday, Friday, mm -hmm. just because slots build up. Mm -hmm. If we were to open up additional slots down the road for broader participation, would that be possible or would that skew and, and present issues for this natural history study? No, I think that's, that's very possible and that's something that I really want to do. Um, especially since there's interest. Um, one of the thoughts as far as um, taking both from the Wolfram Clinic and just our kind of um, just very, you know, obviously early uh, thoughts of, for, and observations from um, the last two days is that what we could do is make the clinic a full week where we um, see half of the families on Monday and Tuesday, have the conference on a Wednesday, see the other half on Thursday or Friday or something, or build it around the weekend or something along those the, um, that so that we could expand the number of spots, but not have to expand expand the number of providers per se. Although expanding the number of providers is another option, we could bring in. You know, I've got several movement disorder colleagues that uh, would be interested in potentially, you know, helping. We could bring in another epileptologist. We could bring in additional PTs and OTs. Um, uh, the other, um, oh shoot, there was some other point I was going to make. Um, Oh, the other thing is, is, I think trying to do it all in a three or four hour window was, was not the best idea. Um, I guess, I think you guys would agree. Uh, I think it, the kids got wor uh, worn out. Um, and I think just having, having the families just come for the, we thought that having the families be there for all day would wear them out, but I think in hindsight, it probably would be better for the kids and the families to be there all day and then take breaks in between, maybe go to the sibling playroom, you know, type of thing, um, so that we're not you know, we're not wearing out the kids. But I, I, I welcome feedback on, on you guys' perspective of uh, how, what, what you think would work best. We've got time for a few questions or comments, if there's any. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think it was first. I generally have problems explaining whenever somebody asks me what's with my son. Mm -hmm. I have to go over like, oh, it's this, 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 that. And it's like it's, it becomes a really complex sign that I lose the person. What was the last, what, what GNAL, GNAL would Yeah, I mean, I think the simplest explanation is that, it, you know, for, even though I, I don't like to call this cerebral palsy, because I, I think this is different, um, for, for, for somebody in the community who's not a medical professional, you can say it's, a, it's, it's, it's just a genetic cause of cerebral palsy and epilepsy. And because people know what cerebral palsy is, um, and say instead of, it's, it's not due to a birth injury, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a genetic cause. You know, um, a more sophisticated answer is that you know it's um, you know it's it's a genetic cause of problems with um, you know neurons talking to each other, and that leads to abnormal movements, um, seizures, and you know uh, difficulty moving. Um, does that make sense? And we don't and and that you know we don't know the long term uh, prognosis. Um, because it's such a new disease. Does that kind of get at what you're saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just, I know you don't have a direct answer to mm -hmm. this, but this is kind of prerogative. How do we all band together to make sure the insurance companies understand that if we do need regular MRIs and we do need sedation, we can get it covered in a different way? I, mean, I don't know, how do we advocate for that to where we can say in the future that Look, this is an unusual case. You don't have a model for this because I feel like we all we all often run into this with our insurance. Is there's they're trying to group us into categories, and what we're doing, especially now here, is we're, we're 
bringing together these new ideas, but we're going to run into the roadblock of them going, well, we don't have this defined at some point. So I don't know, maybe, maybe this is something we all get back to each other on at some point. But yeah. It's, it's, it's hard because every insurance company is different and even the same insurance company I've had on two different patients will give me two different answers. Um, so I think if you go, um, well first of all, a lot of times you're just going to have to get a peer-to-peer -peer conversation uh, with, with, with your doctor um, and have them ask for it. Um, the other thing is, is going into that peer-to-peer, -peer, you have to have, like if you're talking specifically about brain MRIs, ha having a specific question and a specific action because a lot of times they're going to say well why are you doing this you know and 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 if you say well you know depending on what this shows uh, we may decide to have surgery sooner you know we may decide to change the medicine we you know even if it's you know even if uh, so th that type of thing is more likely to convince the insurance companies to kind of, to kind of pay for it uh, but yeah the, the insurance company is not going to know what they have you know you're going to have to explain it to them just like you're going to have to explain it to the ER when you go to the ER you know and it, like you and like the like you know you with any rare disease you have to be the expert like and because un unfortunately and but part of raising awareness is right you know educating other other people such that you know hopefully in the future um, other providers will will know more about this and you won't have won't have to be the expert Mm -hmm. So having met other families and children, we saw that even within the same variants, children are uh, children are very different with different different levels of severity. Mm -hmm. Do you really have any theory about why is that? Or um, uh, th this might be a better question for for the for the basic scientists and stuff. But uh, what we know is that um, that's not uncommon to see in genetic diseases, even sometimes within the same family. Um, uh, two, two children um, will have very different presentations of, of, this, of the disease. Um, and it, we, we think, in general, it has to do with the other genes that uh, the, the child inherits, like that may be interacting with the, with, the, with the one that we know that is abnormal. That, you know, even though they're not, you know, they don't have other mutations, you know, everybody's got, like, different variabilities in, in, in the, the different genes that they have. And so, um, one variability that might still be normal, you know, may interact with our abnorm the abnormal gene in a different way than another one, if that makes any sense. There's also the effect of um, environment, okay? You know, both in utero environments, um, in, you know, even with the same, within the same family, we know that fraternal twins, you know, can have very different outcomes uh, compared with identical twins. Um, um, and so, uh, so, so, so th those are kind of some of the hand waving, you know, like we don't completely understand. Yeah. So, um, one thing that we noticed is with one of the mutations we made in GMA01, on black mice, they died, on white mice, they didn't. So, it was really completely, you know, that there, there are these other genes that each person has a different array of other genes, and those other genes clearly can modify the effect of the primary gene involved. And that's what you know, was, you know, Dr. Crummel's looking at with the IPSCs to ask whether um, if you take the whole genomic environment of that um, person's mutation, you may get different outcomes depending on whether it came to one child or another child. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, okay, go ahead. Yep. Um, will be referred to as this complicated genomic marker name. Can, can we give this disorder a name that we can use after a doctor or a scientist or one of the kids or one of the families? I think I think there's been a movement in the medical field to try to not name it after the doctor who discovered it. Um, you know, in our um, trying to be and, and and sometimes give it a more descriptive name. Um, I mean, we could. It, it kind of all depends on whether it, it like it would catch on and 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 think about the usefulness of it. You know, the um, the um, what what message is going to convey? Because what we really want is for the um, the name to kind of um, convey some sort of message, and it could be 
you know, an emotional message, but it could be to, to shortly explain, to ho hopefully explain as much as you can within a name. You know, um, I don't know if it, other people have. Amy, oh, Dr. Amy. Amy. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I would suggest this is a topic for conversation that we can continue after we wrap up this afternoon. And you know, I don't think we're going to find the perfect solution or the perfect answer because the underlying factor here is the fact that there are only 100 known cases around the world. It's not what it's called. It's the fact that it's so exceedingly rare. And so rallying around a name may help from a marketing standpoint. And, and so there's a decision that we need to have about what are we really hoping to achieve here? And I think what we're hoping to achieve here is greater understanding and awareness from both the uh, fundraising aspect, but then there's also from the research aspect, and then there's also from the um, patient aspect. And so I would just suggest this is a conversation we try to continue on and have among the community, but recognizing that underlying fact that we've got to have uh, reality around the fact that there's only 100 known cases. And as there's more knowledge and, and awareness, that itself can help grow and evolve.